how very exciting to have all of you here with us today for a taste of what we know will be a new adventure with our very own beloved 10th century goddess Brahmani. You know, it's a sculpture in our South Asian gallery and her twin homes in India and San Francisco. And when you have a chance, please go up after the lecture and take a look at the third floor and take a look at the goddess. She's just exquisite. So having experienced a very stimulating and thought-provoking lecture by Professor Kaimal yesterday on ancient temple architecture of, in South India from the Pallava and early Chola period, we know that she will sweep us off our feet today. So thank you, Padmaji, for this rare and very illuminating opportunity. Now we have a few thank yous to express for today's program. First, thanks go to Deborah Clearwaters for the very encouraging and collaborative partnership support with the Asian Art Museum and her rehistory project that she mentioned. We are extremely grateful. To Dr. Forrest McGill, our senior most and leading curator for South and Southeast Asian art and chief curator for the upcoming Beyond Bollywood Dance Exhibition, uh, that you will soon be waiting for, for introducing us to Padmaji's innovative work on yoginis and the exquisitely carved, beautiful Brahmani figure in our collection. Also, a special note of thanks to Society for Asian Art for graciously enabling Sachi to realize this second event following the lecture that we heard yesterday. And importantly, very, very special thanks to our individual program sponsors, Lynn Brewer and Sheila and John Dowell. Thank you so much. This is, we're really honored to have your support. Natasha Reichel, Associate Curator for Southeast Asian Art, will formally introduce Professor Padma Kaimal. She has been intimately involved in several, uh, several exciting Yogini workshops that you have led. Yeah. But before we request Natasha to introduce our speaker, we have a Saatchi recognition for a long-time docent friend and Saatchi founding member, Sally Kirby, who we are very proud to have with us today, along with her husband, who's actually trying to find parking, but will be here soon, Richard Kirby. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Sasachi is in its 25th year since its founding in 1997 and we are honoring each founding member with an event they would resonate with and this event has a special appeal for docents as we are about to expand our learning curve exponentially with today's theme of yoginis and our mother goddess Brahmani. So Sally has been our model docent at the Asian Art Museum from the class of 1977, which is 45 years. Not many of us or none of us can match her great dedication and spirit of learning. Sally, this is wonderful. She has also been an integral member of the Saatchi family of founding members. And we got founded 25 years ago. She served as a secretary of the organization and a very, a very responsible role, which she executed with great pride. And in 25 years, Sally and her husband, Richard Kirby, have never missed a Saatchi annual meeting. And Sally, we'd like to dedicate Professor Kaimel's talk today in your honor. And we thank you deeply for all your years of giving. It is such an honor to have known and worked with you. So let's, you know. <laughs> so with that, we'd like to move on with today's agenda. And I'd like to invite Natasha. Um, you know, she's the Associate Curator for Southeast Asian Art to do the honors of introducing Professor Kaimul today. Thank you, Natasha. Hello, I'm so happy to have been asked today to introduce Padma Kaimal. As Deborah said, she's the Badsa Professor of Art and Art History at Colgate University, where she's taught 
since 1988. Many of you had the luck to listen to Padma's lecture yesterday and heard Larry Mock's introduction detailing some of Professor Kaimal's many accolades, publications, and academic accomplishments. I first heard of Padma many years ago when my advisor at Berkeley, Joanna Williams, assigned an article by one of her brilliant former students on the great relief at Mamalapur. South Asian art history is blessed to be a field of remarkable women. In these days after the recent death of Joanna, I've been thinking a lot about the classes she taught, the way she taught them, and how her pedagogy lives on in the students she taught. So much of it lives on in Padma's scholarship. Never shying away from the difficult questions, paying attention to the people behind the art, the artists, the patrons, the devotees, looking for evidence of people whose place has historically been de-emphasized, like women and the non-elites, interest in the fragmentary, in the connections between word and image, and in all her work, an acknowledgment and exploration of the multivalent nature of art. Much of Padma's work has focused on South India and the temples and sculpture of Tamil Nadu. Her most recent publication is Opening Kailasanata, the temple in Kanchipuram revealed in time and space. Like all her work, it's engaging, challenging, and constantly questioning past perspectives. Many scholars are whip smart and eloquent, but Padma's work also expresses a deep humanity and humility that makes it a joy to read and to listen to. So please join me in welcoming Padma here today. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, it's going to take me a minute to recover. Our, our common advisor, Joanna Williams, passed away pretty recently. And, uh, and I confess it is a loss that I haven't yet really come to, come to grips with. And to have you recognize the ways in which she has inspired me and, and trained me to work is, is deeply moving, so thank you. Oh, I thought we were just gonna be rollicking around looking at yoginis and now you're, you're seeing inside my soul. Oh, okay, one nose blow and I'll be all right. Oh, thank you again, Natasha, that's amazing. And thank you so much to all the groups that have brought me here to talk with you about one of my very favorite subjects, this group of scattered goddesses and the array of fascinating questions that they raise for us. I feel like the longer I study them, the better the questions get and the fewer the firm answers are that emerge around them. So as several of you said, I have I wrote a book 10 years ago, came out 10 years ago, called Scattered Goddesses. And this book is about this set of sculptures that came from India in the 1920s and 30s, exported to Paris, and then scattered, dispersed, to a, more than a dozen sites in Western Europe and North America. The book looks at the first homes, what might have been the first home of these sculptures. It looks particularly at the journeys they took in the 20th century. And it also thinks about their new homes, uh, such as the, the San Francisco Asian Art Museum. That aspect of the book is the one that I'll spend, the, I, I won't spend any significant time on in my prepared remarks, but if you'd like to ask questions about that, of course, I'd be happy to discuss it with you and 
I'm also very happy to help you get a copy of the book. By no means spend $70 on Amazon for it. Go straight to the website for the Asian, for the Association of Asian Art, and you can get it for half that price. So it's, it's paperback. It shouldn't cost a lot of money. I've been shocked. To, and we, we worked really hard to keep the price down. So go straight to Asian. You don't have to be a member, but you can buy it for a reasonable amount of money there. So today what I do want to focus on are, well, I want to show you this, the journeys that these objects took, and I want to think about the temples that they might, the temple they might have been part of in South India. It's long gone, so all we can do is hypothesize about what it might have been. Uh, and of course, I want to make a special focus on the Brahmani that you have here, but also a door guardian that stands on the same wall as she does here. So these objects went initially from the region of Kanchi or Kanchipuram in Tamil Nadu to Paris and then scattered outwards over, the, over about 50 years. Two of them, however, stayed in India. These two pieces are in the government museum in what we now call Chennai and used to call Madras. One of them is a yogini, and the other is a Shanmuga, or Murugan, or Skanda, the prince, the warrior prince who's often cast as a son of Shiva. He's been decapitated and had most of his arms cut off, but it's clear that he used to have 12 arms, and this, uh, this animal here is uh, the remains of a peacock. Two other pieces left India with the ones that I showed you in the previous slide, uh, and the 15 I showed you in the previous slide, and they have since disappeared. I have found photographic records of them in archives in Paris uh, that right there with the photographs of the 15 that I, uh, that I can trace. They came from the same source and then they've disappeared. So I've made a vow that I will show these two pictures every time I talk about the scattered goddesses and ask if any of you have them in your basement or <laughs> if you know anybody who does or if they're in your friend's living rooms. I'm, I'm eager, eager to find them. One of them is the lower half of a yogini, and the other is uh, most of a mother goddess or matrika, although she doesn't look like this anymore. Her remaining leg was hacked off under the care of the Musée Guimet in Paris, or perhaps under the care of C.T. Lou, the art dealer who had the, who, who had a, the dealership in Paris. The only reason I can imagine is that it made her more symmetrical, but it's uh, one of those acts that really uh, weakens the argument that keeping these objects, uh, th that extracting these objects from India was preserving them. So she will look more like the object on the left. Please, please keep an eye out for her. So, as Kalpana Desai mentioned, this Brahmani here is in the San Francisco Asian Art Museum, as is this door guardian. And these photographs are not to scale. I wonder, is it possible we could turn down some more lights and you might be able to see the images a bit better? You're on the right track there. Mm, that's worse. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. Is that helpful? Yeah. Good, good, wonderful. So here are two better photographs where you can see them more clearly. The Matrika Brahmani and the Door Guardian. I'll talk, a, I'll talk more about what we mean by, by Matrika and, uh, and show you some more slides to help set 
her in the context of that image type. So let's first think about the journeys that these pieces took. They, they, they came from a temple that is no longer there. So we have, I have used photographs and visits to yogini temples in other parts of India that have survived to try to reimagine how these pieces might once have operated. So this is a slide to show you what my, my imagination has been doing. And really this whole book is about my imagination. I went to a, a university kindergarten where they told me that, I, they told my mother I should be reading more nonfiction because my imagination was too active. <laughs> so here's a map. Um, based very closely on Vidya Dehagia's map in a really useful book that she wrote about yoginis in art and in literature and in practice. Uh, she was able to find surviving yogini temples in these places and a few off the north end, uh, the north end of this map. The two that I'll be showing you photographs of are one between the Orissan villages of Ranipur and Jarial, and another at Baragat in Madhya Pradesh. Our sculptures, however, come from down here, Kanchipuram, really far away, and until, until um, Vidya's book, and even a little bit in Vidya's book, there's this, there's this sort of shock at finding yogini sculptures this far south. There are still some, some scholars who um, cannot believe, uh, they, they still resist strenuously the idea that yogini worship ever happened in the far south. So here you see your Brahmani in a photograph with six other goddess sculptures in the backyard of the, I, I believe it's in the backyard, in Pondicherry, in southern India, of the man who had them exported from India. He learned about these pieces, which were probably lying scattered, mostly scattered in the countryside to the west of Kanchi. He learned about them and said, yes, yes, I'm very interested, and had them brought to his backyard where he took a lot of photographs. And this set of seven probably corresponds exactly to the seven that he found had been rescued and reinstalled in a temple that he called a, a temple of insignificant modern design. So they had been put back under worship. And, there, and I think this symmetrical arrangement of them is, is very suggestive. It, it, looks to me like, it looks to me like something that, that was very carefully thought out. That is, by the people who put these pieces back into worship. And yeah, we'll come back to that in a moment. So, this photograph, along with the ones that I showed you of the pieces we've lost track of, and these notes are all under the protection of the Musée Guimet in Paris, where there are also three of the sculptures. Gabriel Juvaux du Bois, whom you see in a sedan chair on the far right, was the art historian who was responsible for collecting these yoginis in his backyard, these yoginis and matrikas, in his backyard, and writing these notes here, and giving all of these materials, including the sculptures, the, sorry, the, the photographs and the notes, to the Musée Guimet. I believe he thought that all the sculptures would end up at the Musée Guimet as well. Uh, only three of them are there. So he sent them to Paris to C.T. Liu, a dealer in Asian artifacts who had also um, a, a, a business in New York City. 
and who was almost single-handedly responsible for transforming the collecting patterns of Asian art among museums across North America. He was the person who convinced these, gal these museums to stop collecting chinoiserie, to stop collecting japonaiserie, these things that had been made for export, made for people who, to Asian artisans, didn't know better. And he said, no, 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 you want the stuff that we collect. You want the, you may, we may not understand it yet, but what we respect are these really ancient pieces that, um, and, and bronze, he got them collecting uh, Shang bronzes and jades and, and Indian sculpture from temples. This is his business, home and his place of business in Paris, uh, right in the middle of Haussmann's uh, architecture. He, uh, it's designed by himself and a European architect to look as Chinese as possible. And from inside, oh, I haven't got a photograph. From inside, I, I cut this for time, you look out on Haussmann's Paris, and perhaps even you're looking across the street at the exact apartment in which um, the, the, the Le Recherche de Champs de Temps Perdu was written. So you're, it's, in a, it's in a deeply French neighborhood, and C.T. Lou loved Paris. He married a Parisian woman. He, he loved to waltz. And he, he was a true um, hybrid like me. So he's responsible for then negotiating these sales and occasional gifts of these, these goddesses and their companions across North America and Western Europe. He, um, I think he might have been willing to sell them all to one place, but nobody actually wanted to buy them in more than uh, two at a time. Right here, these three uh, yoganis are the three that stayed in Paris, and they're at the Musée Guimet, and they are exhibited together still against one wall, and uh, they are very powerful indeed. Here's the British Museum and the Detroit Institute of Arts, of course, and they're here as well. So I put together this chronology of how the, uh, this set of objects scattered across, as, as Lou sold them off in pairs or, uh, or singly from 1933 to 1987. And I could never have put this together without the incredibly generous cooperation of all the museums in the United States. And, um, and some cooperation in Europe. There's such a difference on either side of the pond about these ethics, and I feel very lucky to be on this side of the pond. <laughs> so the first, piece, the, the first pieces to go were these three that went directly to the Musée Guimet. The director of the Musée Guimet at the time, Ms. Uh, Joseph Hakin, was apparently according to the notes that I've had access to, in the room when C.T. Lou opened the boxes that came from Juveau du Bois, opened the, un, op, you know, the packing crates that had been flown from India. And so uh, he apparently had first pick. He's, he, and um, he picked these three. These are the only three that Lou didn't sell. He gave them to the Guimet. They are gifts. And then this figure of Shiva, which Ananda Kumaraswamy purchased for the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in the same year, 1933. Next, the Baron von der Heidt purchased this Yogini fragment and the other door guardian, the one who is a pair with yours. And he eventually donated those to the Museum Rietberg in Switzerland. The Nelson Atkins got the, the largest of the yoginis and probably the queen of the set, the, the Devi herself. 
And then here are your two, which came to Avery Brundage in 1958 and to the San Francisco Asian Art Museum as soon as it was founded uh, by the city in 1960. And then, thank you, Loma Prieta Earthquake, the entire Asian Art Museum moved to this fantastic building, which is right in the middle of everything and much more accessible than the Asian Art Museum was when I worked there as an intern back in the 80s. And you have these beautiful big grand spaces that people can come to regularly. I, I understand there are some drawbacks, but personally I'm really happy that all of, that this collection is now here. And there is the man himself, Avery Brundage, who purchased the Matrika and the Dwarapala, Door Guardian, directly from C.T. Lu. Okay, so now let's think about, uh, I guess I, sh I should also observe, a f there are a few patterns I, th I found in the dispersal of these objects. And Lu had them all for sale at the same time. So we're really seeing the tastes of museums and museum directors and curators in these patterns. And what we find is that initially they're going to these old metropoles, the old centers of empire, Paris and London. And then they start trickling across the United States and, um, and Canada, starting with Boston, that, that um, very European city in which I was raised. And then they make their way across to these real frontier places, Detroit, Nelson Atkins in um, Kansas City, these places that still were famous for slaughterhouses and salt mines and really unglamorous things and looking to enhance their, their reputations by having museums filled with fine art. So these yoginis become a part of that project of elevating the frontier and making it as European as it can make itself. We also see that the earliest pieces purchased, the, the, the Shiva in Boston, were the one, was the one that, they, that at the time curators could read iconographically. They could recognize, oh, that's Shiva, he's playing a veena, and we, we know those guys. The yoginis, nobody really knew what to make of yet. We also see that the fiercest of the yoginis were grabbed up first, and then the blander ones went last. And it's really fun to think about why. <laughs> One can speculate a lot. All right. So, um, first, a word about, let's, so now let's start thinking about whether all of these pieces could have been together in one monument, or are we looking at a sort of accidents of dispersal? Is it just that these 15 pieces happened to come to Juveau du Broy at the same time, and they were salvaged from different monuments? Uh, I, I looked closely, and I do most of this in the book, I refer you there, to the style of the pieces, to their measurements, to the way they look on the back, to the style of stone. And I'm convinced that at least 13, we have fragments or most of at least 13 of the yoginis, and including the lost one, and at least three matrikas. And they, the three matrikas were definitely made at the same time. The 13 yoginis are made at the same time by the same workshop. But we've got two really different kinds of iconography going on here. Matrikas and yoginis are different goddess types in worship and in worship patterns and visually. And I'm, I hope you can begin to see that here. In this set, we can see that the matrika is significantly smaller than the, the yoginis. She also, in, also, in a boring art historical way, uh, point out that the backing of all the yoginis is a solid slab with a horseshoe-shaped profile. 
the matrikas were carved more in three dimensions. If you can get around to the back, you'll see that her back is finished and her shoulders are finished. She was carved free from the stone. And what you're seeing right here are the bases of what was probably a horseshoe-shaped arch that was just a band of stone around her. So, um, the, and there are differences in the carving as well. The, the matrika is less, in, less finely ornamented and the, um, I'm just going to stick with style here, not iconography quite yet. And I'm fascinated with the differences between these forward feet. They have, they're sitting in basically the same posture with, the, with their ankles crossed and their knees slightly elevated, one higher than the other. But you can see that the yogini's foot is carved quite fully in the round, whereas the matrika's foot is twisted in an interesting way so that she fits inside a shallower piece of stone. And that, that could be they didn't have a bigger piece of stone. I don't think so, because the hand was sticking out. The fingers broke off, but the hand projected. I think this is a stylistic choice. I, I also think that it's, um, it's because artisans aren't y as yet quite confident in their ability to handle s relief that's very, that projects very far. And their uh, older pieces in the, in this region tend to be m more tightly embedded in the stone and later pieces are really stepping out. So I would actually say that your matrika is older than the yoginis. The yoginis are, I said in my book, 10th century. I've been working with colleagues since then who've con convinced me that it, they could well be 9th century. I think that puts the matrikas in the 8th century. And um, as I say, I, I think they were carved earlier, but that doesn't mean they weren't in the same temple. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. The iconography of matrikas is milder and than that of yoginis. Yoginis are more of a combination of, of beautiful and terrifying. And I've come to think after looking at a number of, of, of yoginis from, the, from sites that are still active, that, that, that still exist in India, that that combination of the, the gorgeous and the terrifying is one of the defining features of yoginis. They bring together what might seem to some to be uh, a paradox. They resolve these energies into a single body. And it, it's, it's really tempting to think of this in contemporary feminist terms, but of course I realize these are not the terms that invented these sculptures. But I, I do think it's possible that, that yoginis were a way of helping people see that destruction and nurture are part of the same cycle. They are not that one is good and one is bad. We're not looking at a Manichaean universe with a heaven and a hell. We are looking at a kind of circle of life thing where in order to, then the yoginis would be helping people remember that, that if you want something to grow in a field, you should put dead stuff in there. You should put rotting, rotting vegetable and animal matter in there, and then you will get better new plants. And you can have something that is a medicine, but if you take too much of it, it's a poison. And so these things are, are kind of embedded in a constant interconnectivity. And understanding that interconnectivity is what empowers us to keep children alive and to help, and to help people pass when it's time. Sorry. So as you can see, this stuff goes really deep for me. So we've got all these amazing yogini sculptures that are still in, in India. 
And I hope I'll ask you for now, rather than showing you a hundred of them, to trust me that this is a pattern that they all that they all manifest, and that these thirteen plus yoginis. I'm saying plus because somebody's found another one, in and she's still in India, and she is under worship, and we don't think that she's safe. We think she would be stolen and put on the art market if. Uh, her location was revealed. So I'm not showing you pictures of her because I don't want her to go. She is being worshipped by a group of women. And, uh, and they are the priests for her. They do, the, they do the, the rituals and they take care of her. She is theirs. So I think it is very likely that these 13 plus figures were in a, the kind of yogini temple that survives now. And these are hypethral temples, that is, they are all open to the sky. And they are structural inversions of the kinds of temples that we see built for male deities. By that, I mean to say that all of their masonry is on the outside and the center is open to the sky, rather than having a big courtyard with a closed shrine for Shiva or Vishnu or even Surya, the sun god. The wow. goddesses, instead of uh, Vishnu or Shiva, will sit inside and look out at you. These goddesses sit around the outside and they look in on you, which means that when you are in these yogini temples, you are the object of all their gazes at the same time, and you can't begin to return them all. It's an incredibly, uh, an incredible subject position. You are not in charge. They are in charge. They are terrifying, and they are nurturing. They can protect you. They can kill you in a second. And there you are. That is the universe of the yoginis. This temple that we're looking at here is between the villages of Ranipur and Charyal, as I say, in Odisha. And this one happens to have a shrine at the center that has a figure of Shiva still in it. And he's contemporary with the yoginis. The yoginis are all, at this temple, are all dancing, and Shiva is dancing too. There are at least two Shivas that may, may have been part of this same set of yoginis, and there is the Murugan. In my book, I lay out an argument, um, an argument that Murugan stood at the center of this yogini temple. He is carved fully in three, three dimensions, fully finished on the back, and his arms would have radiated all the way around him, and his heads, his six heads, would have been looking in six directions as well. So he would be perfect to sit at the center of the gazes of 42 or 64 or possibly even 81 yoginis. That's how many yoginis we see on surviving temples. So here are the yoginis that we have. Um, I'll walk quickly through their locations. This, these three are at the Gime. We've looked at them briefly. She is at the Nelson Atkins Museum. This goddess is in Toronto at the Royal Ontario Museum. This goddess is in Washington, D.C. at the collection we now call the National Museum of Asian Art, formerly known as the Sackler Freer. This goddess is in Detroit at the Detroit Institute of Arts. This one at the British Museum in London. This one at the Minneapolis Arts Institute. This one is gone. This one is in Zurich, Switzerland, at the Riedberg, and this one is cemented to the floor at the Government Museum in Chennai. So here's a quick look at the, the pattern I mentioned to you. The, the really fierce ones went to these old, these metropoles, these centers of dying empires in London and Paris. And then across, the, across North America and here in, um, in, in Zurich, the fierce ones went first. The ones with the fangs, very visible. The ones whose eyebrows are rising up. The ones who have hair, very untamed. S 
rearing cobras on her body here. And um, this one in Toronto ha is wielding these objects that uh, are apparently a tong, a tong and a hammer. So it could be for forging. The goddess of smallpox carries these as well. Um, I think these weapons often are signifying in both directions to their ability to nurture and to destroy. So you can, you can make new things out of metal. You can also torture with these, with these tools. And the pain of smallpox is often alluded to in these, the hot tongs of these images. So one other thing that, uh, that's distinctive about yoginis, in addition to them resolving the auspicious and the inauspicious, the mangala and the amangala, the nurture and destruction of existence, is that they have a very wide range of iconographic signs. In fact, from one temple to another, different yoginis have different names and carry different things. We don't have the same set of 64 at all the temples that survive or in all the lists in, in the tantras, the texts that describe yogini worship. They are infinitely variable and they come in really big gangs of, as I say, 42, 64-ish, 60, 61, 64, and then the biggest one is 81. So you, those of you who like math will see, we're looking at multiples. We're looking at six times seven, we're looking at eight times eight, we're looking at nine times nine. And the idea of multiplicity, I understand as an expression of these, as the infinite number of emanations of the female divine. The goddess radiates through the world of form in an, in a, an uncountable number of forms. And these big gangs are a way of trying to get at that idea, We're trying to visualize that idea for worshipers. Mother goddesses have a different iconographic profile. Here are a few, a couple of sets. Uh, they, can, they can come in, they generally come in sets of seven or eight. Uh, once in a while, nine, but there's usually, the ninth one is a, a replica, a duplicate of one of the others. Matrikas, uh, so a much smaller number to begin with, Matrikas are older than yoginis. We find matrikas from the Kushana period, so from first, maybe second century BCE. And they are, sometimes, sometimes we see them with babies, but very rarely. So the word matrika doesn't signify ha generating babies. The stories associated with the matrikas have to do with them being also fierce and nurturing. They are the Pleiades, the, the, the constellation of seven sisters. And when they find baby Skanda, uh, having just been born, all alone and vulnerable on a mountaintop, they surround him and they first say, let's eat him. And then, he's, and then they realize he's so cute. And they say, let's nurse him. And so they keep him alive. And there you can see that same idea that we see later in the yoginis, but it's earlier there with the, with the matrikas. When we see matrikas in sculpture, though, that fierce part of them is really minimized. They tend to be, they may be dancing, they may be sitting, but they're, they're, they have usually two or four arms. They're quite mild in their manner. And Michael Meister has made a convincing argument that we're really looking at a kind of appropriation and domestication of goddess worship in temples dedicated to male gods when we're seeing the matrikas. They'll be in subordinated architectural spaces, like on a lintel over a doorway, or in a secondary sh um, little shrine off to the side. Um, and 
And they all are marked with the iconography of a particular male deity. And they're described as subordinated to the male deity. They carry the male de a version of the male deity's name. So one of them is like Indra, she's Indrani. One of them is like Varaha, the boar demon, she's Varahi. And they are, they are these kind of tamed versions of the goddess once we find them making their way into architecture and sculpture. So we, your matrika, your brahmani, is a, a later emanation of that, a later version of that idea. And notice she doesn't have any fangs. She's carrying a, a rosary here, and she has a little bird on the front of her seat. The other, the yoginis, have like headless corpses and rearing snakes and and much fiercer sort of familiars on their on their platforms. So she is still embodying that milder, the milder kind of personality that we associate with matrikas in sculpture and architecture. Here we do know that matrikas are being represented in sculpture in Tamil Nadu. We have this example in the Kalasanata temple from the early 8th century. And you know, there's, they've got some weapons here, and they're wearing tall crowns. They kind of look like a book group, you know, they're kind of all on the same, same bench and leaning on each other, crossing their legs, resting on each other. This one over here is fierce. She's holding a skull cup. All of the yoginis in our set are holding a skull cup which is made from a human skull and uh, to drink blood out of. So this is a sign of the ferocity of yoginis. But only one matrika do we tend to see doing that. In this photo I showed you earlier, there's a second matrika. The piece on the far right is a varahi that is now in, um, the, uh, in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan Museum of Art. And just ignore the size difference, that's just a function of the photos. So here again we can see there is the, the base of what would have been uh, some kind of a band of stone around her, but she, like your Brahmani, is carved away freely from that stone backing. She's carved in three dimensions and um, she has the kind of mild iconography that we see in your Brahmani. She has v matching jewelry and ornamentation. You'll notice that both of these goddesses have their hand open, which is the gesture of Varada, which means granting a boon. They're not holding the skull cup. It's in this lowered left hand that the, other, that the yoginis are holding a skull cup. And then this is also a matrika, this lost piece, with mild iconography. She's cut, she was cut fully in relief. We can see the base of that band of stone over here. And she is the same, she, she looks to be the same proportions as the, the two that we do have surviving. I've judged that by looking at this and other photographs that were taken by Juvo de Broy in his backyard. And we see the, the same backdrop for uh, the, the, this backdrop for other sculptures. And that allows me to say that this one is smaller than the Yoginis. So, how could these both be in the same temple? They, I think that they were perceived in the early 20th century by whoever put them back into worship, they were perceived as being part of the same, they could all be matrikas. They could all be in this monument as seven matrikas, even though I now read the iconography of five of them as a yogini. But that idea of yoginis in the early 20th century may not have been a strong one, particularly in Tamil Nadu. The yogini temples that we do find surviving in India, um, we, we find them being built 
in the 9th, 10th, 11th, maybe 12th century. And then they did stay in worship, although perhaps rather quietly, and no new ones were built after that. So there's a kind of efflorescence of yogini worship at the end of the first, beginning of the second millennium of the Common Era, but then they may, there may be a lot of forgetting that took place. We do have an example in Baragat of, um, this is, Baragat is where the, there's a temple with 81 goddesses in it. These 81 goddesses include gorgeous yoginis like this that are being carved in the 9th or 10th century, and a set of uh, several mother goddesses that were clearly carved earlier, that were from the 7th century. Debala Mitra has written a wonderful piece about this. My deduction from all of this is that when you have a, suddenly a commission, I need a temple with 81 goddesses in it, you get everybody you can to start carving sculptures and you find older sculptures that you could bring in to the purpose, to be part of the crowd. And there's a frequent understanding in the tantras that, it's not all tantras, but particularly tantras from Odisha and a couple of others, that explain that while the matrikas are emanations from the goddess, the yoginis are emanations from the matrikas. So once again, we're seeing the math. We're seeing, okay, you could have eight matrikas and then they would have yoginis emanating from them and you would, that way you get to 64 or you can vary the numbers and get to bigger numbers, but that idea of multiplying could put, in some cases, put matrikas in the middle of the multiplication process. So it made sense, I think, for matrikas and yoginis to be in the same monument. In some of the lists of tantras, we see the names of yoginis and we see the seven or eight matrikas added in there as well. So if this could happen in Baragat, I think it could have happened in Kanchi. They, your yogini, your, your matrika is older than the yoginis, but she may have been in their temple. She may have been reused from an older monument when this big project of building the yogini temple west of Kanchi took place. And so together with the yoginis, they may have sat around a circle, perhaps a rectangle. Some yogini temples are rectangular. Just as we see the yoginis in Baragat sitting around a circle, opening onto a big courtyard. And then this picture is what I keep going back to. We see in, in um, Jupo du Bruy's notes that he thinks he has found a set of seven matrikas. And he is, re and I think it's because that's how they were being worshipped. And he redeploys them in this way and he tells C.T. Lu, I'm sending you seven matrikas. And then his agent in South India keeps coming back to him and saying, oh, you like those, huh? I like the way you paid me for those. There's more. Would you like some more? And he keeps going back to the field and dragging in more and more. And then the notes from Jouveau de Bruy start getting really confused. Well, I don't know, maybe it's not the matricas. Maybe there are some sisters with the mothers. And, and like, because th there's too many to be matricas. And there's too many to be like two sets of seven. There are, because they're not matricas, a whole bunch of them are yoginis. So, so now let's look at your door guardian. His companion is in Zurich, and jo Johanna Loisen de Lu wrote a wonderful piece about um, climbing around Avery Brundage's basement. And no, she knew about the one in Rietberg because she worked at the Rietberg Museum. And so she, she gets, Brundage brings her over here as a scholar to look at what he's got. And she's climbing through this mess. Uh, nothing's displayed. It's all just packed together in his basement. And she's, 
Imagine my joy at discovering the lost companion of our beautiful door, door guardian. And she writes a wonderful piece explaining exactly how alike these, these two brothers are. Is it possible that they stood at this Yogini temple guarding the entrance? Here you're seeing the ground plan of the Yogini temple in Hirapur in Orissa. That temple entrance is guarded by, is flanked by two door guardians. Here's a view of, oops, here's a view of the exterior of that temple. This is a photograph from Juvaux de Broglie's archive collection in the Musée Guimet, which shows the two of them together in his backyard. This is the Zurich piece, this is your piece. But his notes say that these two, he, so he sent, he, pa he packs these up, he boxes these up with the Yoganis and with your matrika, and he sends them all at the same time to Juvo du Broy and sorry to um, C T Lu, and that's why I was I was initially like tracking down. Yeah, these all must have come from the same place. But then further, I wasn't given full access to his notes in the Gime. Other people have since been given better access, and they found that he says quite specifically that these came from a different location. These came from a site called Dada Puram. So I think it's m likely that he was not part of this same Yogini temple in, in Kanchi, or west of Kanchi, but that he ends up getting cobbled together with them as, a, as part of like, oh look, Monsieur Tangavelu brought me more stuff from the countryside, I'm sending it all to C.T. Lu. Juvo de Broy is in India, where he wants to be all the time, he hates Paris. He's in India on C.T. Lu's nickel. C.T. Lu is paying his living expenses and his travel expenses and a salary to keep him in India to find stuff to send to C.T. Lu to sell. So that, that, um, those motives are very, very clear. And he's finding everything he can and shipping it off to C.T. Lu. And your glorious door guardian is roughly the same time and perhaps even by the same workshop as the Yoganis, but I don't think they were installed in the same monument. Now, so what now? As some of you may know, I've been, I've been part of several workshops already hypothesizing whether a reunion of these yoginis is a possibility. Could they all come together even briefly for a special exhibition? When they are together, they signify in an amazing way that you cannot begin to experience when you see them individually. They are all subtle variations on a theme. They're, every single one of them is posed in, at a, her spine is at a slightly different angle. Her knees are at different heights. She's holding slightly different things. Her hand gestures are subtle variations on her sisters. So that when you would have stood in a center of a circle and looked around at them, it could have looked like a flip book. It could have looked like frames in a, in a movie and you are in fact being surrounded by motion. They're all sitting but none of them are resting. They're all swaying and the Shiva figure in, in Boston was holding a vena as well as a drum. So music is implied in this circle. When they're back together you can see Shiva's playing music and the yoginis are dancing to his music. I, when I, you know, the epilogue to my book, I say, oh, wouldn't it be great? These yoginis need to come back together. And now some lovely curators who are now taking care of these in Detroit and Washington, D.C. and um, in Kansas City have been, have said to me, would it be okay if we organized an exhibition? And of course, I, I lost my mind. I said, yes, it would be great. Can I help? So we've, we've been meeting uh, repeatedly with as many of the curators 
of these pieces as can get together each time and with everybody who's written scholarship on them and started to try to figure out what do we do to bring them together? We're now scheduled to have an exhibit in 2027 and 28 in Detroit, in DC, and I hope in San Francisco as well. We're going to have a symposium in November, trying to think through the ethics of this because it's not a simple thing to just bring them together. What are we celebrating? How could this be read by people who don't have our same assumptions about these objects. And should they stay together forever? If they stay together forever, where should that be? Who owns these yoganis? It's no simple question. Thanks so much. <laughs>